morning, church. It's good to be with you. If you're new or if it's your first time here, welcome. My name is Scotty James. I'm one of the pastors here. Let's get into it. If you've got a Bible, let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. If you don't have a Bible, the scriptures will be up on the screen, or most of them at least will be. And there's also a little study guide there for if you want to take notes. Genesis 1, 26 to 28, which I'll read. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. When I was coaching, there's a lot of dynamics to coaching. You want to train your players. You want them to know the plays and have the proper skills, fundamentals, all that kind of stuff. But I think one of the biggest focuses that I had when I was coaching was I needed to shape a mentality in the players. There's a certain mentality that you had to have if you were going to be successful. If you had all the skills and all the fundamentals and all the talent, but the improper mentality, it would mean nothing because your mentality oftentimes shapes how you're going to be or, or who you're going to become. So a mentality is a mindset. It's, it's, a, it's a way of thinking. It's, a, it's an approach to life, so to speak. And so a mentality is vital in athletics, but in a mentality is vital even more so to your spiritual walk. My hope today is that I would, by God's grace, use the scriptures to help us form a, an accurate mentality of how we're supposed to approach this thing we call life. Because if we're, our mentality is off, our, our walk is going to be off. And so when God created Adam and Eve, he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue. And so this can mean many things, but in its simplest form, God appointed Adam and Eve to bring order and exercise dominion over all of creation. So you might say that God made him in his, in his image to serve as his, as his ruling agents. They were chosen by God to represent God and exercise the power of God upon the earth. So that was God's original intent for humanity. That was the original position that humanity was supposed to hold. God did not create humanity and say, okay, let's just cross our fingers and see how this works out. Let's just hope nothing bad happens to them. Let's just hope that they're successful. Let's just hope that those creatures on the earth aren't rude and mean and and cruel to them. Let's just hope they're able to survive because what's ahead of them is greater than the power that's behind them. He didn't say any of that. He made mankind, and he said, rule and subdue. What we have to see is that God did not create mankind to operate in this spirit of powerlessness. God made mankind to walk in power. To be fully human, if you want to know what that really means, to be fully human is to walk in the power and authority of God and to live under the power and authority of God. That's what it looks like to be fully human. It's not to walk in the state of powerlessness, hoping bad things aren't going to happen to you. That's not how it was from the beginning. From the beginning, we were made to walk in and live under the power and authority of God. And anything less than that, I believe, is a subhuman experience. And I think we misunderstand this sometimes, even in the church. I think sometimes we see being human or being a Christian as being weak and being powerless. And we have this mentality that's not scriptural, and it causes us to live in weak ways. We see ourselves as Christians as just hoping the world doesn't kick us around. And it's easy to come to this conclusion if you misinterpret scriptures. When you read uh, scriptures like Matthew 5, 38 to 40, if someone slaps you, turn the other cheek and and, and give them the other cheek, you think, oh, I'm, I'm made to be weak. Or if you read 1 Peter chapter 2 and Peter says, submit to your authorities 
even those who are, are rude and harsh. You see that and you think, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to be weak. Or Matthew 18, 21 and 22, when the scripture says, how, long, how many times should I forgive someone? And the Bible says 70 times seven. You think, oh, I'm, I'm made to be weak. And you can inaccurately form this perception that you're supposed to just be this kicking dummy to the world. And the world's going to just rule over you and subdue you when you are just left vulnerable and weak and just a lame duck. You see the martyrs of the faith, the early church, how they were martyred for their faith. And it's just easy to come to this conclusion. But if you've ever held that idea, I want to reframe that. I, I, I hope that through God's word, you can start to see what we're actually supposed to be and what God intended for us. So I want to show you a little story from Acts chapter 16 that I hope helps you see this a little bit differently. Go to Acts chapter 16, or write it down. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. Acts 16, verse 16. It says, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. So some little context, there's a man named Paul and Silas. They're walking, minding their business, serving the Lord on their way to a place of prayer. And there's a slave woman who's demon possessed, who is uh, shouting out things about them. And they become irritated and they become uh, frustrated by her. And so they decide to, to do something about this, to, to, to take matters into their own hands, so to speak. Let's look at verse 18. It says, she kept us up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Okay, so Paul and Silas decide to do something. Right? They, they, they say, okay, we have the power to do something in this situation. They cast this demon out of her, and it leaves. And so it seems like the good guys won, right? Well, the situation gets a little bit more intense. Look at verse 19. When her owners realized that their hope of making more money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. And this is what I think we tend to see, or we can mistakenly stop at. Christians getting beat up again. They stood up for themselves, they operated in power, and then they got knocked down even harder. These, these men take Paul and Silas and they forcefully drag them to the city officials and they accuse them of something they didn't do. But then it doesn't stop there. Then a crowd of people join in and they strip them of their clothing. So what this often meant back then is when someone stripped you of your, of your clothing, they took all your clothes off. And this was meant to humiliate you. In a culture like Jewish culture, which was really modest, to be stripped of all your clothing was to just beat you down and humiliate you. But it didn't stop there. Then they beat them with rods. So they got a, a, a bundle of rods, and these rods were not meant to just punish you. It was meant to be a sign of authority. Every strike across your head is me showing you I have authority over you. But then it didn't stop there. Then they whipped them, they flogged them. To be flogged is to be chained to a post and whipped, whip after whip as this whip uh, goes into your back and exposes your flesh. And then they throw them in prison and, and, and lock them in chains. Now consider that, you're bleeding, you're hurt, and then you're locked in chains in a first century prison. Think about how uncomfortable that must have been, how unsanitary for their wounds that would have been. And all this happened to Paul and Silas. Now, this is a real story, but I want to use a, a figurative lens, so to speak, because it sort of brings out the story that, 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 that many of us sort of adopt. Paul and Silas represent the people of God, and these officials represent 
the world apart from God. And Paul and Silas were taunted by the world, and they decided to do something, but then the world upped the ante in an effort to let Paul and Silas or the people of God know, hey, we have power over you. You are powerless, people of God, and we are powerful. We, the world, dragged you and seized you and falsely accused you because we are more powerful than you. And then we stripped you of your clothing and humiliated you because we are more powerful than you. Then we beat you with rods and we whipped you across your back all that we wanted because we are more powerful than you. Then we locked you in chains and put you in a prison because we are more powerful than you. Christian, know this. Remember this. We, the world, are more powerful than you. That's what this is communicating in a figurative sense. But the story isn't over. Go to verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Okay. So after all that, Paul and Silas stay up all night singing and praising God. Then an earthquake happens, and all the doors fly open, and the chains come off. And then the jailer goes to kill himself, and... Paul stops him from killing himself. So let's get something straight. Let's, let's bring the whole equation together and interpret this properly. If you seize me and strip me of my clothes and beat me with rods and whip me and throw me in prison, and then I respond by staying up all night, singing praises to my God, and then my God opens the prison doors and the chains come off, and then your jailer goes to kill himself, and I save his life, let's be clear, that doesn't mean that you are more powerful than me. That means that I am more powerful than you. I took your best shot, and while I sing throughout the night, my God undoes your works. Church, you need to listen. You are not powerless. You are not vulnerable. You are not under the subjection of the world, you are made to rule and subdue this world. The world, the enemy, is not more powerful than you. No, in Christ, you are more powerful than the world. We need to reclaim this mentality because too many of us walk around not just with victim mentality, but just waiting for something to happen to us. I don't have the strength to do this. I can't overcome this. I'm afraid of this. And while I understand, I understand, I also understand who I was made to be. I'm not saying that we suppress our fears or that we suppress pain or that we suppress things that are going on. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is don't lose sight of who you were made to be. God made you human to rule and subdue this world, not to be ruled and be subdued by this world. Things don't just happen to us. God made us to happen to things. You look at Joseph, Old Testament. Okay, if you don't know who Joseph is, Joseph, a lot of stuff happened to him. Thrown in prison, falsely accused, sold into slavery, left in prison. A lot of things happened to him, but when you really look at the big story, God was using Joseph to happen to the world. What happens is Joseph ends up, by God's grace, God uses Joseph to, to preserve the messianic line through which Jesus would eventually come from and bring salvation to the world. So stuff didn't happen to him. He happened to the world. You look at uh, Stephen the Levite, Acts chapter 7, first martyr, stoned to death for his faith. But as he's dying, what does he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was dying in a position of strength, and God used his death to spread the gospel. We've got to understand, church, you are not weak. 
You are not powerless. God made you to walk in the authority and power of God. I've said this many times during our series. What was lost in the garden was reclaimed at the cross. From the beginning, you were made to walk in the power and authority of God. But we sinned and we screwed that up. No doubt about it. But Jesus on the cross died for our sins, and he's moving us back to what we were originally created to be. And that means walking in the power and authority of God. Interesting. Some of the first words that Jesus says after he rises from the grave and before he's ascended to heaven, I'll write down Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Look at what Jesus says before he goes into heaven. I don't know if it's on there. Yeah, it should be on the screen. It says, Jesus says, but you will receive what? Power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What's happening? Jesus is moving us back to what we were originally intended to be. We were made to represent God and walk in his authority and power. And before he goes to heaven, he puts his spirit inside of us through faith to be his witnesses, to be his ruling agents, to be those who would represent him walking in power and authority from on high. Here's the key word in all this. Power and authority of God. Okay, power and authority of God. Not power and authority of yourself. That's where we get it confused sometimes. Sometimes we think, I'm supposed to walk in this power and authority because of me. And how good I am. And how much I work out. And how good looks I got. And how much money I have. We're not talking about earthly power here. We're talking about heavenly power. If I write, write, write down uh, 2 Corinthians 12. Verses 7 to 11. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to 11. It won't be on the screen, but I just want to read it to you. This is Second Corinthians 12. Okay, it says, this is Paul talking, I'll, I'll start midway in the verse. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. So he's acknowledging there's something happening in his life that he has no power to control. He's weak. He, he's not able. But then look what he goes on to say. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and persecutions and hardships. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the key to all of this. When he is weak, then he is strong. When he comes to the end of himself, when he stops trusting in earthly power, when he stops trusting in earthly influence and stops putting his, his, his belief and his dependence on that, and he translates that into God, then the power of God is made manifest in his life. We've got to stop trusting in the things that the world trusts in, whether it's money, whether it's influence, whether it's intelligence, whatever. That stuff's all cool, but we don't put our trust in that. We put our trust in God. When we are weak, then we are made strong. So it's with all that context that God has made us to walk in and under his authority that I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and break this down for a few minutes and then we'll close. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. This is the, the one in your notes. And we're going to look at some uses of how we're supposed to use these bodies. First Corinthians 6, 12. You guys with me? You guys all scared now, or is everybody? <laughs> Good. Good. All right. Verse 12. It says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. All right, so Paul is writing a letter to 
The Corinthian church, and they're very worldly in their living. They're saved, but they don't live like they're saved. They've, they've been forgiven of their sin, but they still walk in very sinful ways. And so Paul's trying to correct their, their mentality and correct their way of living. And then he addresses their sexual ethics. And he starts off by saying, I have the right to do anything. And your notes circle that in your little, your little blurb or that little section right there. I have the right to do anything. So what, what's happening right here is Paul is, is quoting an imaginary opponent. This person wasn't real, but this, this, this imaginary opponent sort of represented the consensus or represented the mentality of the people at this time. Saying everything is permissible or saying that I have the right to do anything was their way of, of justifying their sexual behavior. It was their way of using their liberties to do whatever they want. Their liberty as a license to do whatever they want. So I have the right to do anything means that, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm not bound by legalism. I'm not bound by the Old Testament law. Therefore, I can do whatever I want with my body. That was sort of the the spirit of this motto. I can use my Christian liberty to do whatever I want with my body. And while this was true, it was only kind of true. Yes, it's true that as a Christian, you're not bound to legalism. You're not bound to the Old Testament law. But that's not like the whole story. And so Paul corrects them. He says, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Underline that. You have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. So your liberty and how you use your body has some limits, is what Paul is saying. And one of those limits is fruitfulness. That word beneficial, it can be translated a lot of ways. It means constructive, productive, expedient, helpful. So what Paul's saying is, look, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you can buy that item doesn't mean you should buy that item. Just because you can date that person doesn't mean you you should date that person. Our liberties have some limits. We were made to to rule and subdue and to be fruitful. And so the use of your body in unfruitful, unproductive ways isn't really what God intended for you. It's the first thing he says. Then he brings another word of instruction. Go, Go back to verse 12 again. I have the right to do anything. Not everything's beneficial. I have the right to do anything but I will not be mastered by anything. Underline that. I will not be mastered by anything. Hmm. If we could adopt that and live by that. I will not be mastered by anything. That word mastered, it means to have power over or to exercise authority upon something else. It's to guide or control something. So picture a remote control car. When you have a remote control car, you are distinct from that car, but you have control, complete control over that car. You push the trigger and it goes. You pull it back, it stops. You say go right, it goes right. You say go left, it goes left. You have complete authority and control over that car. And Paul says when it comes to life, don't let anything have that sort of control in your life. Don't let anything have that measure of power or that measure of authority in your life. Why? Because that is a subhuman experience. Even though you have freedom, your freedom should never be used to bring yourself under the control of something else. Why? Listen, this is why. Because that seat belongs to God. That is why. We have to understand, God is jealous. Okay? I didn't say insecure. God is jealous. What that means is that God is protective. He's protective of a few things. He's protective of his glory. He's protective of his people. And he is protective of his position in their life. The very first commandment of the ten... Exodus 20, verses 1 to 3. I am the Lord your God. Have no other gods before or besides me. That's God's way of saying, look, 
I share my throne with no one. I play second fiddle to no one. I don't come off the bench. I am not an alternative. I am not a backup. I am God. I am the creator, sustainer, redeemer, and authority of all things. I don't take a back seat. From day one, God makes that known, and this is why we're not to be mastered by anything. Because when you come under the control of something, you give that something a position that belongs only to God. No matter what it is, you're dethroning, to some degree, God of his rightful place in your life. We are only to be mastered by our master, which is him. So what does this look like in our context as we sort of prepare to, to, to close in a few minutes? What does it look like in our context thousands of years from when Paul wrote this? I'll give you a, a few, I mean, it means a lot, but I'll give you a, a, a few areas of focus that are, that are pretty obvious for us to apply in, a, in our context, okay? So when you talk about our body and how it's supposed to be used, three things, here's the first one to write down. The body is not meant to be mastered by substances. The body, your body, my body, it is not meant to be mastered by substances. Okay, write down Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Ephesians 5, verse 18. Write that down next to that little phrase. Paul says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Okay. So Paul says, do not be drunk with wine. Notice what Paul did not say. Paul did not say, hey, avoid wine because wine is evil. He did not say, it is sinful to drink wine. What did he say? He said, don't be drunk with wine. Don't be intoxicated with wine. When you're drunk, it's called being under the influence. I think that's such a telling term. You're under the the influence, you're under the control, you're under the authority, you're under the power, you're being mastered by that. Paul says don't do that. Don't be mastered by alcohol. Why? Not just because it's bad for your body. There's a bigger reason, because that seat belongs to God. It's his spot. He's the only one who deserves that sort of power and authority and influence in your life. So this isn't just a goal of Paul to stop your fun. It's, a, it's an effort to protect God's rightful space. And he doesn't just say, don't be drunk with wine. Go back to it if you don't mind. Look at verse 18. Do not be drunk on wine, and he gives you the positive. Instead, what? Be filled with the Spirit. So instead of being drunk, be filled with the Spirit. Instead of being controlled by wine, be controlled by the Spirit. Instead of being mastered by wine, be mastered by the Spirit. The body is not meant to be mastered by substances. It's meant to be mastered by our master. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 6. We'll look at verse 13. Paul says, you say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Second one to write down. Talk about how to use your body. The body is not meant to be mastered by the body. Sounds like a play on words, but I'll explain what I mean. The body, your body, my body, is not meant to be mastered by the body. Paul says, food for the stomach and stomach for food. All right, so here, this is another one of those models that they had at this time. The line of thinking was food for the stomach and the stomach for food. What that means is that food was made for my stomach, so when I'm hungry, I eat, because that's where food is supposed to go. And so they applied that line of thinking to sex. And they said, well, when I'm hungry, I eat. When I want sex, I go get it. 
And they used this, and this drove this mentality drove them into seeking after prostitution and things of that nature. If you go on further in the passage, Paul talks about how the body's not meant for prostitution. And so this idea that the food for the stomach and the stomach for food, again, it was this mindset that I obey my body. Whatever my body desires, I'm going to fulfill that desire because I have the right to do anything. And Paul says, not exactly. That's not, it's not really how this works. Yes, your body has, you, you have the right to use your body, but there are, again, limits in how that body is supposed to be used. What we need to understand as believers is that these bodies are wonderful, but they also feel the effects of sin. And you can't always trust your desires because your bodily desires can oftentimes be disoriented or out of order with what they're supposed to be. We sometimes desire things that we don't need. Or we desire things that are not healthy. And if we're mastered by our body, we will live a life that's enslaved to these sinful desires. You can write down 1 John chapter 2. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. 1 John 2, 16, 15 and 16. It says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father but from the world. These bodies desire sinful things at times. We have to understand that. You can write down Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians 5, 16, it says, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. These bodies are sick with sin, and they can't always be trusted. And if we're mastered by them, we will not live according to what God desires us to do. I'll give you another scripture you can write down. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. I don't know if it, I guess it will be on the screen. 1 Corinthians 9, 26 and 27. This is Paul's approach to the body. First Corinthians 9, 26 and 27. He says, therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself may not be disqualified for the prize. Paul is saying, don't be mastered by your body. He strikes a blow to his body. Why? Because he has mastery over it. Your body doesn't tell you what to eat. You tell your body what to eat. Your body doesn't tell you when to get out of bed. You tell your body when to get out of bed. Your body doesn't tell you your limits on drinking. No, no, no. You are called to tell your body its limits on drinking. We're not called to be ruled by these things. We're called to rule over these things in submission to the Lord. I want to encourage you. Uh, uh, this has a lot of application, uh, a lot of different areas of life. Oftentimes, and this is connected also to, to, to the first point. A lot of times we're kind of like point the alcohol thing. Like, ah, don't be addicted to alcohol. And obviously you shouldn't. We point it to weed. Yeah, you shouldn't be stuck on weed. Of course. But there's also some other kind of like acceptable Christian vices that we sort of just turn a blind eye to, right? It's not that big of a deal. Sugar, it's not that big of a deal. You know what I'm about to say? Coffee, it's not that big of a deal. Social media, technology, it's not that big of a deal. But what does the Word of God say? I will be mastered by what? By nothing. By nothing. I will not give that seat up to anything. Not my phone, not a cookie, not alcohol, not nothing. I will be mastered by nothing because I was made to rule and subdue, not to be ruled and subdued by this world. And so our body, we've got to, by God's grace, rule over these things and not let them rule over us. One more for you and then we'll close. Go back to 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, I mean, verse 12. I have a right to do anything, but not everything's beneficial. I have a right to do anything, but I will be mastered. I will not be mastered by anything. Hmm. One more for you. 
Write it down. The body is not meant to be mastered by emotions. The body is not meant to be mastered by emotions. I see some men looking at their wives. <laughs> Focus on yourself. The body is not meant to be mastered by emotions. Write down Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 26. Ephesians 4, 22 to 26. Paul says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its sinful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Verse 26, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. This verse is similar similar to the wine verse. Paul didn't say wine is evil, wine is sinful. He said don't be drunk with wine. Paul here didn't say that anger is evil and anger is sinful. He said be angry but do not sin. So I'm going to translate this differently to sort of prove the, the, the point I think the Bible's trying to make here. Said differently, do not be drunk with anger. Do not be intoxicated with anger. Do not be controlled by anger. Do not be under the power and authority of anger. Just as wine should not be your master, anger should not be your master. Why? Because that position belongs to who? Belongs to God. Sometimes our emotions can serve as our God. We are not to suppress our emotions. We've talked about this for weeks. To be human is to be emotional. All good. God made us with emotions. We are to feel and experience those emotions. Being emotional doesn't make you weak, doesn't make you insignificant, doesn't make you feminine, doesn't make you soft, doesn't do any of that stuff. Our emotions are wonderful, and yet we are not to be ruled by our emotions. Our emotions should not tell us what to do and what not to do. Just because I feel it doesn't mean the thought that I have connected to it is accurate. In fact, oftentimes, the thought that you connect to undesirable emotions isn't always accurate, which is why you should never make major decisions when you're highly emotional. You're not always thinking clearly. Your emotions aren't always connected to the truth. They may feel real, and they are real, but the thought that you're forming that's connected to it isn't necessarily real. And so we can't be led by our emotions. That's anger, that's sadness, that's joy. I just met this wonderful man. He's got the softest blue eyes. He's in, I've got to marry him because this feeling inside of me is leading me to believe that. But you don't know him. You can't just trust that feeling. You can't be ruled by your emotion. You've got to let that cycle through. Bring that to God. And so you were not meant to be mastered by your emotions. You were meant to be mastered by who? By your master. So as we wrap this up, where are you at with all this? Let's start with the mentality. What is your mentality to life, your approach to life? Do you see yourself as this weak, powerless, vulnerable little thing just hoping stuff doesn't happen to you? Or do you see yourself as one called by God to rule and subdue in his authority and in his power? Do you see someone, yourself as someone who, I can't overcome this habit. I can't overcome this struggle. Or do you see yourself as one who is empowered by God to overcome that habit and overcome that struggle? Yes, it may be difficult. I'm not saying you suppress that and deny that. No, no. But you cannot do it on your own. But, but by God's grace, you, you actually can. No, you actually can do it. You actually can do it. Not in your strength, but in God's strength. Where's your mentality? Do you see yourself as what God sees us, or do you see yourself as something else? And the second thing, are you allowing yourself to be mastered by something? Are you using your body or your Christian liberty in a way that brings you out of the power of God and into the power of something else, whether it's a substance, whether it's your body, whether it's your emotions? That is a subhuman experience. 
God wants you to be mastered by nothing but him. And when you are mastered by him and you're growing in this uh, knowing what it means to walk in his power and his authority, guess what? Now you'll start living the life that God called you to live. Now, in all circumstances, you will be more than a conqueror. Now, things won't be happening to you. You'll be happening to things. And it may not look like you think it should look like, but by God's grace, he's going to redeem it and use it to build his kingdom. Let's be a people who see ourselves accurately, who have the proper mentality, and who walk in the power and authority, none of ourselves, but of our master. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord, would you please give us a proper perspective of who we are? We are not weak. It's just not true. We're not weak. We are not powerless. We are not enslaved to old habits or enslaved to mentalities or enslaved and beat down by this world that's far apart from you. We were made to rule and subdue. Let us believe that. Let us walk in that. Let us grab hold of that and walk in your power and your authority. Your power, your authority. We're not strong because of us. We're strong because of you. Give us humble hearts. Help us identify our weakness. It's when we're weak, it's when we give up on doing it our, ourselves, then we're made strong. Help us be weak that your power might be manifested in us. And if we are submitting ourselves to any form of mastery, please help us to renounce that, to step out of that, to not give, to not give your seat to anything or anyone. We want to be ruled by you that you might reign and rule through us. Do these things, please, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody sit together. Amen. 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 Turn to your neighbor and say, you ain't weak. You ain't weak. You ain't weak. Again, that, that, that doesn't mean that things are always going to work out. That doesn't mean that I'm going to necessarily win every basketball game or get every job. That's not what I'm saying. But what it means is that in every season, in every circumstance, we are more than conquerors for Christ. That's what that means. In every season, I'm able to reflect God, and, and God is able to redeem anything and everything. And I live in a position of power, not a position of weakness. And so when I slap the other cheek, I don't turn and give you the other cheek out of weakness. I do that out of strength. And when I forgive you, even though you sin against me, I don't do that out of weakness. I do that out of, out of strength. We operate in a spirit of strength, not a spirit of weakness. Let me stop before I start preaching again. <laughs> Serious. Uh, fire me up. We are not weak. You ain't weak. Prayer team will be here if you need prayer for anything. If you're dealing with the spirit of powerlessness, let them pray for you. Start removing that. It's not going to be an instantaneous thing necessarily. This is a process. This is a journey that we're all on. Learning what it means to live in this identity as people who walk under the authority and power of God. Let them pray with you. If you're new, welcome. Uh, stop by, say hi, uh, stop by the welcome booth, and I want to encourage you, walk in powerfulness or, or walk in the power of the Spirit this week. Uh, pray that God will reveal any mentalities that you're holding on to that are not accurate, and let's continue to pursue what God made us to be. Amen? All right, God bless you all. Be safe. See you next week.